Well, I am ready to get into the word of God. Are you ready for the word today? If you're ready for the word, say, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm feeling good. And um, we're going to be in Acts chapter 16. And we're go I'm going to read in your hearing verses 22 through 28. When you have it, you can stand. If you don't have it, it's on the screen for you. We are um, in the midst of a series called Shift because we're believing God to shift so many things in our lives. And God just put it in my heart, in the heart of the leaders here at Link Church, that over the next five weeks, we want God to shift things in your life and in our lives. So a couple of weeks ago and last week, we gave away the shift cards. And if you didn't get a shift card, make sure you get a shift card today and you write in that box, right on that card, what you're believing God to shift in the next few weeks. We believe if you walk with us through these next few weeks, you'll see an amazing move of God in that area. And so we're excited about this series. We're going to continue it today with the second installment out of Acts chapter 16. The Bible reads this way. Then the multitude rose up together against them against Paul and Silas we're talking about, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid, laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But at midnight, somebody say midnight. midnight. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, somebody say suddenly, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prisoning, prison Awaking from his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Remain standing. I'm going to pray. But today's subject is incarcerated connections. Incarcerated connections. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to hear from you today. Somebody, God, today came in here and we they desperately need your word. I pray right now, God, the word of God would find them in the point of their need. And I pray, God, you would do what only you can do. Fill us now with your glory. Fill us with your presence. Let your word transform us and make us new today. We thank you in advance for your power. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord, y'all. Incarcerated connections. So I have with me today some Legos. I hope you can see some Legos. I tried to get the biggest Legos you can find. Um, not you can find, but the biggest Legos that I had. Because uh, when I was preparing for my sermon, I stole these Legos from my son, who is four years old. And, and he saw that I had taken these Legos. And he says, Daddy, what are you doing with my Legos? I said, boy, be quiet, because you don't even play with them anymore. These are for like two-year-olds, <laughs> two-year-olds. And, and, and he was like, what are you going to do? I was like, I need it for my sermon. Why do you need it for your sermon? I'm like, hold on, sir. Why are you asking me so many questions? Do you want to preach, Caleb? No, no, he doesn't want to preach, but I have these Legos today. And... These are important Legos because I want to show you something that I heard a preacher talk about, and I never saw the visual. I just heard the audio of him describing Legos and how it relates to us as people. 
and how the object of Legos is to connect, right? Is to use the connectors to build. But what he was saying is that on every piece of Lego, there are connectors. There are connectors, and you have a certain amount of connectors per Lego piece. And the interesting thing about it is that your life is a lot like a Lego piece. Because the way that God moves and shapes your life, he uses it through people. He uses people, rather, I say it better, he uses people to shape and to cultivate your life. He uses relationships. He uses the people you encounter. And everybody in here has a set number of connectors that you have in your life, meaning you have a capacity to connect. At a given place in your life, you have a capacity to connect. And if you understand this, it will really cause you to live a better life and a less worrisome life. Because what we often do is that we have, a, we have our Lego piece, which is our life and our capacity to connect, and we have four connectors. But because we're so loving and caring, we bypass the fact that we only have four connectors, and we try and connect with more people than we're really supposed to, and that's why you're stressed. You're stressed because you don't really understand the value of relationships in your life. And you can only carry a certain number of important and significant relationships in your life. And the person that does not understand this concept is the person that tries to take on too much. The person that tries to connect to too many people, you try to have too many friends, you try to help too many people, and you wonder why you're depleted. Because you're trying to help your spouse, you're trying to help your kids, you're trying to help your best friend, let alone your mama and your uncle and your co-worker, and you only have enough space to help a certain amount of people. And I, and I look at this today because Lee Church is all about connection. You know anything about Lent Church, you'll hear us say that you ought to live your life connected. That you should live your life connected to God and connected to, be, to people. Traditionally, church does a great job of connecting you to God, but not so good of a job of connecting you to people. We, we don't really get the essentials of how to build healthy relationships from church. And I want to talk to you today about three connections that we see in the text that we read. That we have Paul and Silas who have been spreading and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they have been preaching in many regions. They are now in the region of Philippi, and they are pushing and promoting Jesus. Now, if you know anything about that time in that culture, you'll understand that it was a hostile environment. And if you preach Jesus during that day, you were, you were subject to being put in jail or to being ostracized or to being flogged or to being killed. But they preach Jesus in a hostile environment. And maybe you don't find your environment to be so conducive to your Christian faith today. But God wants to put enough purpose in you that you will preach Jesus regardless of your environment. Paul and Silas. They are partners. The first connection I want to talk to you about is Paul and Silas because they are partners. And if you're going to succeed in life, if you're going to make it through life, you have got to have a partner. Yeah. Link Church is a talk back to me church. So, so don't be afraid to say amen, preacher. Uh, uh, you got to have a partner. Doesn't mean you have to have a spouse. It means you have to have a partner. 
because God does his best work through partnership. It, 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 you serve a God that is not self-centered. He is not egotistical, nor is he selfish, but he does his will through partnership. When he created the earth, he did not leave his glory within himself, but he spread his glory and he partnered with the earth that he created. So he created a sun and a moon. And you would think like that the sun and the moon are, are opposites, like they are not partners. But the sun has its job to give light during the day, and the moon has its job to give light at night. They are partners. Even though they provide different functions, they are partners. We see the partnership of God as he made a man and he made Adam. He did not leave his image and his likeness in heaven, but he decided to touch humans. And he said, in order for my will to be done on earth, I've got to partner with man. So he breathes into man and man becomes a living soul. Now, man is a soul entity and he looks at Adam and he says, it's not good for man to be alone. And he gives Adam a partner and he creates Eve. Can't you see the, the continuity and the path of partnership that you serve a God that is keen on partnership? So he takes Paul and Silas and says, in order for you guys to be effective, you've got to be partners. Now, one thing you've got to know about Paul and Silas is that they weren't always teammates. Paul had another teammate named Barnabas. And they were going throughout the region preaching the gospel. But a time came when they had op opposing thoughts, opposing philosophies. And the Bible says that Barnabas and Paul separated. They separated. So Paul picked up a new partner named Silas. That, that's a little background to where we are. And I think that is important because the apostle Paul understood relationships. He probably understood it better than you and me. Because Paul had no issue with letting go of somebody that was not in alignment with his purpose. Oh, and there is somebody in here today, you are struggling with letting people go. It does not mean that Barnabas is a bad guy. It does not mean that Barnabas is not saved. It does not mean that Barnabas does not love Jesus. It means that Barnabas is not tied to where Paul is going. So Barnabas becomes disposable. He can't take Barnabas with him because maybe Barnabas will not be able to push Paul when he needs to be pushed. And could you have somebody or some people right now in your life that are not going in the same spiritual trajectory that you are going in? Could you have some friends or some acquaintances on social media or some people in your phone that you need to delete? Because they're just toxic for, uh, uh, as it relates to your purpose? Are, are, do you have relationships that are weighing you down? Do you have connections that are not pushing you to your best you? This is a season, y'all, where we can't get caught up in the culture. The culture that says that I've got a thousand friends. I've got 2,000 friends. I've got 10,000 followers. Because this social media culture will push you into thinking that everybody that you connect with through a computer screen is your friend. But you, you got limited space. And Paul says, I only have room for two. It's only me and Silas. Paul had Luke with him. He had Timothy with him. But, but, but rolling in the trenches, it was just him and Silas. Because Paul understood that my purpose is so big 
that my circle needs to be small. The bigger your dream and your vision is the smaller your inner circle needs to get. It doesn't mean you can't have acquaintances, have friends, have co-workers that you connect to, but you need to draw a circle around the meaningful relationships in your life and decipher between what is significant for this season and what is disposable. So let's jump into the text. And we see Paul and Silas on their way walking down the streets of Philippi. The backstory is they meet this girl who is a woman that practices divination. She, she is a woman that speaks to evil spirits. And they have the magicians in that city who would pay this woman to read horoscopes and to predict futures. And this woman would follow Paul and Silas as they walk through the city and say to them, hey, these men are of God. They're, they're prophesying, they're preaching, they're of God. And Paul and Silas got annoyed by this woman, not because she was telling a lie, but because the source that was giving her the information was the wrong source. So Paul and Silas said, because the devil is giving you clues into my future, I've got to cut you off. So they cast the evil spirit out of this woman and her leaders, the people that made money off of her soothsaying. They now were upset because Paul and Silas were messing with their money. And when you mess with people's money, oh, they change, they change, they change, they change, they change. If you were at Link Church a few months ago, I talked to you about Pastor Marcus. Yeah, Pastor Marcus. Pastor Marcus is, is a brother that you haven't met. Pastor Marcus is, is, is a brother that lives in a certain corner in my house. He, he, is, he looks like me. He dresses like me. And sometimes he comes out and he says things that don't sound like Pastor Mark. It sounds like Pastor Marcus because Pastor Marcus is the petty pastor. Pastor Marcus is the pastor you don't want to meet. Pastor Marcus is the pastor that you got to watch out for. And you're looking at me and saying, Pastor, how can you have a Pastor Marcus at your house that sometimes will rear his ugly head and sometimes will say things he shouldn't say and think things he shouldn't think? And I want to say to you, you got another side too. Don't look at me that crazy. You got somebody that you left at home today you put your church clothes on, you put your church face on, and you left them at home because they are not welcome here at Link Church. But let somebody get on your nerves. Yeah, let somebody step on your toe wrong. Let somebody talk about your mama. Yeah, that's fighting words. Don't, don't talk about my mama. And you'll see how quickly that other person that lives in your house gets in a car, drives to Link Church, and shows up and gives the person that talked about your mama a piece of their mind. Paul says, I've got to get rid of this spirit that is speaking truth. But the source is incorrect. So because Paul and Silas mess with their money, Paul and Silas find themselves in jail. They are placed in prison. And I want to show somebody today that you may be in a prison. Maybe it's a financial prison. Maybe it's an emotional prison. Maybe it's, in a it's a prison in your family. Maybe it's a prison in, at your job and you, and you just feel like, how did I get here? How did my marriage get here? And you're wondering what happened. But I want you to see that there is purpose 
in the prison. Who told you that your prison is not connected to your purpose? Who told you that you would not have to go to prison? Who told you that your emotions wouldn't ever live in a prison? Who told you that your business wouldn't ever be so locked down financially, it'll feel like it's in prison? I want to show you that Paul and Silas were incarcerated, but they were incarcerated for a purpose. Because your prison is the pathway to your purpose. And we have been conditioned at, as Christians, especially in our Western culture and our Western theology as it relates to God, we have been conditioned to think that prison is not the path to purpose. If you lived in certain remote Eastern countries and remote Eastern cities, They go to prison for preaching Jesus today. They understand that physical prison may be the pathway to their purpose. But we over here in our comfortable, air-conditioned Christianity in America, we feel like prison is not the path to purpose. You know why we feel that way, Osby? We feel that way, man, because prison is a place of isolation. And I told you before, it's not good for man to be alone. And what prison does is it cuts you off from relationships. You can only see your mama once a week, see your mama once a month. It cuts off the relationships that mean the most to you. You can only write your mama a letter from prison. Prison doesn't feel good, whether it's physical or it's emotional. And we always attribute prison to be a work of the devil. But could you be calling a work of God a work of the devil? Because it was Paul and Silas's purpose to be thrown into prison. Why is that? Because incarceration, when it relates to God, everything has a purpose. Everything has a reason. And incarceration always or often will bring association. God wants to, he allows, I should say, he allows the incarceration because he wants to associate you, connect you to a greater purpose. And I want you to see that Paul and Silas are in jail. They're in jail for a reason that I'll tell you as we continue. They're in jail for a purpose and God wants to use them for something great. They are, they are, they're in jail, they're in prison. They have a certain mindset, y'all. The mindset that says, I'm in prison, but yet I will still praise God. Y'all ain't hear me. They have this mentality that some of us don't have. That they're looking at their environment and they're saying, I'm in prison, But yet I will still praise God because God is worthy of my praise in the prison and he's worthy of my praise in the penthouse. God is worthy of my praise when I am down and God is worthy of my praise when I am up. And God always understands the people that are really connected to him because they don't praise God based on their circumstance. They praise God based on who he is. Is God still God even though you're in financial struggle? Is God still God even though your kid is sick? Is God still, I feel God, is God still God even though your marriage is on the rocks? Is he still worthy of your praise? And is there anybody in the auditorium today that will say no matter where I find myself, God is still worthy of my praise today? 
Yeah, he's worthy today because he is God all by himself. He is Elohim. He is El Shaddai. He is the exalted one. He is the uh, God that is more than enough. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is Jesus. He is my bulwark. He is my shield. He is my buckler. He is my bridge over troubled waters. He is my everlasting God from everlasting to everlasting he is God and he is worthy of my praise so whether the bill is due or not I'm still going to praise God and I wish I had a link church today that would say and say pastor I'm with you I'm gonna lift my hands today I'm gonna clap my hands today I'm gonna open my mouth today I may be in a prison but devil you've got another thing coming if you think that prison is enough to keep me Shama, from praising my God. Devil, you got to come harder. I'm a Rocky fan. I love Rocky. And Sylvester Stallone, he, he's in Rocky 3. Clubber Lang is hitting him. He's like, hit me harder. Hit me hard. You see, y'all ain't up on it. Come on. Link, hit me harder. Hit me harder. I know the devil has hit you hard, but if you praise God, you'll be able to say, hit me harder. And, and, and they are praising God. Now, if you've been in church at any point in your life and you've heard this sermon preached, um, more importantly or more specifically, I should say, if you heard this sermon preached in a charismatic church, most preachers use this text. To say praise will get you out. Praise will, will solve your problem. If you praise God here, the bill will be paid. If you praise God here, your mama will be healed. And I would like to apologize for the erroneous theology that is being perpetrated by preachers with agendas. Because if you're a scholar of the text, and if you walk closely with God, you will understand that praise is not the antidote, but praise is the invitation. You will understand that praise does not rub God's belly. Your God is not so shallow that your praise has the ability to cause him to act on your behalf. That would be a very shallow God that you could somehow hoodwink God and manipulate his power based on your praise. Oh, oh, y'all ain't with me. That your praise would be so powerful to manipulate this omniscient God into moving the mountain in your life or to paying the bill in your life. And you maybe have been under the notion, the erroneous theological notion that somehow praise does it for you. But I want you to look closer at the text. The Bible says at midnight, if you find that scripture at midnight, I want them to see it on the screen. At midnight, Paul and Silas began to sing and to pray. Wow. Yes, Lord. Verse 25. And they sang hymns unto God. And verse 26 says, suddenly there was an earthquake. So we all live in this America, this level of Christianity, this thought that if we praise God, then the earthquake comes. If we praise God, the shift will happen in our lives. But I want to show you that that does not line up with scripture. What Paul and Silas were doing is that they were praising God not to get out, but they were praising God so that God could get in. Oh, y'all, y'all ain't with me. Your praise does not get you out of financial trouble. Your praise lets God into your financial trouble. Huh? Your praise does not get you out of your marriage. Your praise brings God into your marriage. 
I feel God in here today. The Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. I wish I had somebody that knew scripture. God inhabits the praises of his people. So if you want God to see about your situation, stop praising God to get out. But start praising God for him to come in. Yeah. Is there anybody at link today that needs God to show up Monday in your situation that needs God to show up at your job, to show up in your kids, to show up for your parents, to show up in your business. We need to worship God right now for 10 seconds, not to get out of your prison, but that God would come in your prison. Yeah, 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 yeah. Paul and Silas are bound. They're bound in the prison. Praise does not get them out. God gets them out. There's a difference. Praise is you. God's power is him. And what they were saying is that we're praising God for who he is. We're not praising him to get out. How do you know that, preacher? Read the text. Somebody turn to your neighbor and say, read the text. We're, we're establishing a church here that you will read your Bible. Why does your pastor want you to read your Bible? Because people will say a lot of things that are not really in the Bible. And if you don't read your Bible, you won't know. So you shouted off of a message that says praise will get you out. No, God will get you out. And, and, and. Why, why then, pastor, if I praise God here and I go home and it's shifted and my bills are paid and then the thing I'm believing God for, it happens. Why does that happen? Was it my praise? No. Your praise invited God in and he decided to work. But what do you do when you invite God in and he decides not to work? They're in chains. And you don't praise God you praise God hoping he works, but you don't stop praising him if he doesn't work. They're in chains and they praise God and their chains fall off. If you could put the scripture up, I believe it's verse 20, yeah, 26. You got it. It's up there. And it says the prison doors were open. There was an earthquake and their chains fell off and the doors were open. This, what happens next is so significant, and this is why I believe Paul and Silas weren't praising God to get out. They were praising God for him to come in. And I believe that because in verse 27, it says that the keeper of the prison, the jailer, noticed that the doors were open, and he got up from his sleep, and he says, oh my God, I failed they told me to keep these prisoners secure. And more specifically, Paul and Silas are in here. And they told me, don't lose these two. And now the doors are open. Uh, they're going to kill me. And because he's, he's in, under Roman rule, he knows what they do to people that mess up. He doesn't want to go through the abuse. He says, let me kill myself quickly. And Paul, he, he shouts from the back of the cell and he says, hold up, jailer. Don't kill yourself. Verse 28, it's on the screen. We are all here. This is why I know they're not praising to get out. Because when the doors open, they don't leave. Oh. They, they don't leave. 
they don't leave, y'all. What makes people that are innocent stay in a prison? What is the power? It's not the shackles. It's not the bars on the door. What is keeping Paul, Silas, and the other prisoners? Not just them. All the other prisoners, the criminals, the murderers, the thieves, they all stay. What is keeping them? Purpose is keeping them. Because I told you incarceration brings association. And Paul and Silas realize that God has placed them in the, per, in the prison, not for them to just say an earthquake happened, we experienced God, and now we are shifted, and now we're doing it for ourselves. But they realize it's not about their shift only. It's about somebody else. And something is holding them in the prison, y'all. And I want to tell you, purpose has a power that a shackle, a bar, a, a depression, a, a suicidal thought, a low self-esteem, a bad habits. Purpose has a power that those things don't have. And maybe last year you were in prison because you were so depressed. And, and you got out, you came to Link, you're starting to feel better, starting to feel free. Why are you still in prison? It's because purpose has you there. Because purpose will hold you hostage. Because purpose is always about somebody else, not about you. Because God uses your purpose to impact somebody else. And purpose will hold you in contempt and won't take you out of financial struggle because there is somebody that is connected to your prison that God will uh, release you until their life is changed. The jailer is about to commit suicide and it's the voice of Paul. If Paul would have left, the jailer would have died. If Paul would have left, his family would not have been saved. But Paul stayed. Purpose held him because his purpose was connected to the jailer. You're saying, Pastor, this is an isolated scripture. I want to tell you that Jesus is a model for so many things. And your Jesus did the same thing. Your Jesus was innocent like Paul and Silas were. Your Jesus was not a criminal. Your Jesus did not do anything wrong. He was in all points tempted, yet without sin. But one day, the Sanhedrin council took him captive. He was a slave. He was a prisoner. He was bound and incarcerated. But what was the thing that kept Jesus, hallelujah, that kept Jesus? from walking away and leaving his prison what was the thing that kept Jesus hanging on the cross what was the thing that held Jesus where there was no shackle you got to understand that Jesus is God and if Jesus wanted to come down off the cross he could have snapped his fingers winked his eye angels would have come and they would have released him but he was on the cross it wasn't the name that held him it wasn't the ostracizing and the abuse that held him it wasn't his lack of strength that held him he was held by the purpose that was connected to the people that were connected to his glory and he knew that purpose is such a hostile hostage taker that purpose will hold you yeah, it will hold you hostage even when you can go free because Jesus knew that there would be people at Link Church today that would be ready to kill themselves. Oh my God, Jesus knew over 2,000 years ago that there would be somebody at Link Church struggling with depression. And if he left that cross that day, you would not have a hope today but thanks be unto God that gives me the victory I've got victory today I've got power 
shower today. I don't have to slit my wrist today. I don't have to throw in the towel today because Jesus was held hostage by purpose. You're the jailer. I'm the jailer. Incarcerated connections. And you think your purpose only works when you're out of jail. There's somebody in here today that thinks your purpose only works when everything is right. You can only start the cake business when everything gets right. I want to tell you about incarcerated connections. And Paul and Silas are not the only ones. Joseph in Egypt, he, he was incarcerated. But his incarceration brought about association. And he met a butler. He met a baker. And he made connections. If Joseph did not use his gift in prison, if he did not interpret the dream of the butler and the baker, when I believe the butler was that got out and went to Pharaoh and told Pharaoh that there's somebody in prison that can interpret your dreams. If Joseph never used his gift in prison, he would have never felt a shift from God. And there's somebody in here saying, God, when am I going to feel a shift? God, when am I going to experience a shift? God, when are you going to move in my life? God, when are you going to move in my family? It's because you're not seeing the connection in the prison. And you feel like your purpose does not work here. And I want to tell somebody at Link Church today, your purpose works where you are. It works when you're depressed because your depression is connected to that coworker who looks at you and says, how, how did you get out of your depression? I, I want to connect y'all to people out there. The, the, the point of Christianity is for you to be relational and to use your passion and your purpose. Maybe your passion is playing basketball. There's somebody you play with every week at the gym that is connected to your purpose, but you feel like my purpose doesn't work here. It's about incarcerated connections. And so Paul and Silas, this jailer, is connected to them. And if you keep reading the story, you'll see that the jailer comes running into the prison. He falls down, y'all. And he says, what do I have to do to be saved? Because he is shocked that they have not left. He is shocked that they have not escaped. Somebody that you know is going to be shocked at how much you care about them. They're going to be shocked that you didn't take advantage of them. They're going to be shocked that you operate in integrity. They're going to be shocked that you operate in loyalty. They're going to be shocked that you're still there. So the jailer says, I want to be saved. Don't you know that your life has the ability to draw somebody else to Jesus? And, and, and y'all should have shouted when I was talking about praise. Because... Maybe this part of the sermon stings. Maybe it stings because we're too selfish. Maybe it stings because you've never been to a church that talks about making a difference in somebody else. That's why we have the Link Squad. That's why people serve in Link Kids. 
That's why people set up and break down. That's why people work in marketing. That's why people use their gift to make a difference in somebody else. That's why we have a leadership program at Olympic High School. Because it's about making a difference in somebody else. And, and, and the jailer takes Paul and Silas back to his house. His whole family gets saved. Wouldn't it be a blessing if that family member you have that you've been praying for got saved? Wouldn't it be powerful if that nasty coworker, under your breath every day at work, you're like, Lord, 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 I need you to work on them, Lord Jesus. Wouldn't it be a blessing if, if they found God? The jailer takes Paul and Silas back to the house. The whole family gets baptized. They get baptized because they say, hey, I want to publicly declare my faith in a Jesus and a God that showed up for Paul and Silas's prison. But he just did not show up for their prison. He showed up in my prison, too. And maybe the jailer realized that Paul and Silas was sent there for him. Maybe that's why he got baptized. Maybe you're here at Link Church today and you're saying, man, this was, this was good today. And I felt God today. Maybe Link Church was started for you. Perhaps Link Church was started for you to get baptized. Maybe they set up the pipe and drape today for you to see Jesus. And his whole, this jailer's whole household gets saved. Now, I, I don't know if y'all got the last scriptures up. Everybody stand because I'm finishing here. I want you to see this. Paul and Silas go back to the house, y'all. And they stay. The next day, in verse 34, they brought them back to his house they rejoiced and believed in God. Next verse. Yeah. That's all you got? All right. So what happens is they believe in God and they, they, they put their trust in Jesus. And something significant happens because the magistrates, the leaders that put Paul and Silas in jail, they say, you got to release Paul and Silas. Release these prisoners. Paul says, I'm staying. Don't release. Y'all got to read it when you go home. I wish I had it. You got to read it when you go home. Paul says, I'm staying. Don't release me. In fact, if you want me to leave, come and come get me yourself. Come get me yourself. Because Paul realizes how much purpose there is in the prison. And this word is for somebody today. I, your shift is connected to somebody else. God wants to shift your life so that the reverberations of your shift are felt by your friend. And they will see who Jesus is. Thanks for tuning in. I pray that this word from God blessed you and encouraged you in some way. If it did, go ahead and subscribe to this channel. We want you to stay connected with everything that God is doing at Link Church. And secondly, you can share this with a friend. Maybe you wanna share it with a family member. You never know how one word from God will change someone's life. I wanna encourage you and let you know that God has a purpose for your life. I'll see you next time and until then, Take care.